Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming, many of you coming back for the third of these uh, Stimson lectures on international politics and, and uh, American foreign policy and global affairs. Uh, we started starting a minute or two late because in the course of this week we have variously met at uh, room 203, then been brought down here, then met at 203, and now we're in the third one, we're back down here. I think everybody is now aware that we're in this room this, this afternoon. Since this is the third of the Stimson Lectures, uh, and Professor Andrew has been introduced already, I'm not going to do much more than a, a brief remark here. We are grateful to the anonymous donor of this magnificent series of public lectures which occurs at least once, once in a year time uh, in honor of Henry Stimson, one of the greatest uh, Yalies and uh, Secretary, of, Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State. Uh, the lectures which are being delivered this year by my a guest here, Professor Christopher Andrew, uh, on the theme of intelligence and intelligence history. We heard on Monday of the way in which in the history of decrypting and intelligence are developed, first of all, in Asia, moved across steadily to be something after the 1500s, which was more of a, a Western form of statecraft and intelligence uh, for, for politicians and for leaders in war. We heard on Tuesday a wonderful talk about the uh, Anglo-American intelligence history and relationship from George Washington right through into the Cold War. And this third and final Stimson lecture is to be given on the theme of uh, Russian, Tsarist Russian uh, intelligence and Soviet intelligence through until the end of the Cold War. Professor Andrew has distinguished himself in a long career of writing a whole series of books, including a British uh, official history of intelligence and, uh, and a variety of works on both British, on British American, and on Russian Soviet intelligence. So I think uh, we're greatly looking forward to this third and final of the Simpson Lectures. Chris, please. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, my intention is indeed to come up to the present. Um, um, and uh, as usual, what I will be trying to uh, persuade is, uh, I think, an axiom that it's not really necessary to persuade anybody in this uh, circumstance, but that anyone who attempts to um, interpret the present in terms of the present uh, is bound to get it wrong. But uh, we, all, we know that already. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is to concentrate um, on the last uh, 100 years and um, to argue uh, that um, Tsarist intelligence has an extraordinary influence on Stalin's intelligence, and that Stalin's intelligence has an extraordinary influence on Putin's intelligence, and that the area where this intelligence, this uh, extraordinary development has had most impact is precisely in the, the West. So um, we begin with this um, image which is, um, I suppose, I mean, the most forgotten centenary in international uh, relations um, uh, this year. But the, the, Lu the Lubyanka, the current head of uh, Putin's FSB, and before that, uh, the head of the KGB, and before that, uh, the first head of the Cheka. Curiously, unless during question time somebody can think of another one, and somebody possibly can, this is the only intelligence headquarters which has remained the same for the last um, uh, 100 uh, years, and it shows no sign of, um, of uh, moving on. Uh, so here we are. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, Russia under Tsar Nicholas the, the Second. And w what is extraordinary, it seems to me, I mean, the single thing that is most wrong about uh, the way that um, uh, uh, many people have sought to interpret the impact of Russian intelligence on the outside world is they've done it entirely in terms of human. Russian spies appear to be interesting, you know, to the people of Salisbury, amongst others in Britain at the present term of time. But Russian code breakers attach, attract a tiny fraction of the interest of um, those who were at uh, Bletchley Park. So I will try and um, put that right. 
Russia under Tsar Nicholas II was the world leader, not simply the European leader in Sigint. And furthermore, Russia had a bigger lead in Sigint, in my judgment, than at any period before or since. And this when we so why? Well, it's very simple. I mean, uh, the best way to succeed at SIGINT is be, to be extremely good at cryptanalysis, but also to cheat. And the best way to cheat um, is simply to um, uh, exploit to really poor security in embassies, which is, which is why, since uh, uh, embassy security in St. Petersburg, as it was and is now again before the First World War, was worse in the British and American embassies, um, the easiest targets that Nicholas II's intelligence service had were precisely the British and uh, the Americans. So here we are, George Mayer, uh, U.S. ambassador to St. Petersburg in 1905. I have discovered beyond a doubt that the Russian government has in their possession our entire um, uh, cable code. Why it had taken them 30 years to discover that is um, very bizarre. Uh, and of course, exactly the same thing happens in the British Embassy. Sir Charles Harding, who goes on to be the permanent head of the uh, Foreign Office, uh, misspelt, by the way, in the, uh, in, the, in the fourth line I just noticed. Um, while he was uh, ambassador, he wrote to the Foreign Office that he'd had a disagreeable shock. Well, again, why had nobody noticed this over the previous 30 or 40 years? But anyway, they hadn't. A leading politician with whom he had had dinner the previous night, quote, did not mind how much I reported in writing what he told me in conversation, but he begged me on no account to telegraph, as all our telegrams are unknown. The, the only odd thing about that is it took them somewhat by surprise. There's no, no excuse for that. But the thing I think that most requires a certain amount of revision in the history of international relations before the First World War are the relations between these two people. Now, just look at the expression on the face of Nicholas II. And then look at the silliest moustache of the, the pre-First World War period, which is obviously the Kaiser on the right. You can tell just by looking at Nicholas II that he realizes, as many people did, uh, but the Kaiser didn't, that he was rather an idiot. And um, uh, you, you could also see uh, that uh, the Kaiser uh, thinks that he can pull one over on Nicholas II without any difficulty. So it never occurred um, to the Kaiser that this man on whom he looked down um, was regularly reading intercepted German diplomatic telegrams and also making demeaning comments um, about the Kaiser, appropriately demeaning comments about the Kaiser, quite similar to those which many historians have made since. So here we are. Um, shortly after he begins reading it, Tsar Nicholas II writes on a decrypted 1895 telegram from Berlin to the new German ambassador in St. Petersburg. Childishly foolish advice. What did he think about the Kaiser? That he was childly, childishly foolish. Now, to my knowledge, there's not a single historian who would disagree with him nowadays. But uh, Nicholas II arrived at that co co conclusion. Not a brilliant man. Uh, but he arrived at obvious conclusions without too much uh, difficulty. Um, and so this, I think, makes it possible to look at the July crisis, which leads up to the precipitates of the First World War, in a rather different way. The British have no code breakers at this point. Um, the Germans have no code breakers at, um, at this point. Uh, the Americans barely know what a code breaker is. Um, but the French and the Russians, no. So this famous meeting between uh, Raymond Poincaré, the man with the top hat, the um, president of the French Republic, uh, who was the man who looked after uh, foreign policy, and Nicholas II, what are they discussing days before the outbreak of the First World War? Sigint, that's what they're discussing. And uh, what are they most discussing? Well, we don't have the record of their discussion, but we know that they, they knew uh, about how they had advanced knowledge of uh, the Austrian ultimatum to Serbia. Now, how did they get that? Because the Russians were decrypting the Austrian communications uh, to, um, uh, to uh, St, uh, the ambassador in St. Petersburg. Right. Now, um, just um, uh, a little bit of uh, background for what follows, which I think is uh, apologies because we're well known probably to just about everybody here. Lenin founds the Cheka a forerunner of the uh, KGB, only six weeks after the Bolshevik Revolution, 
under the leadership of Stalin's friend Felix Jozinski. And I think it's been insufficiently noticed um, just how close friends uh, they were. Um, of course, w what happened um, throughout the, uh, the Cold War was that the tallest statue, which was outside the Lubyanka, which was the first image I showed, was not of Lenin, it was not of Stalin, it was of Felix Jozinski. And that is why um, the great symbol of the end of the Soviet era is the pulling down of Jozinski's uh, statue. So there he is being trampled um, underfoot, gives a good example of just how big he was. And there he is being taken away to the graveyard uh, of uh, uh, statues on the outskirts of uh, Moscow. But of course, they're now beginning to go up again. And this is not of the same size, but it's only a year ago in Kirov. And it's, it's not the only one. So uh, thanks mainly to Putin, um, uh, Zorzinski is back in favor. And what tends to be forgotten about um, Putin is that ever since he was a child, and I'll come on to this in a moment, as a teenager, he was obsessed, and I think that's the, the accurate verb, he was obsessed with Russian intelligence history. Russian intelligence history going back centuries, not simply during the, uh, uh, the Soviet era. There are many glorious pages, bright examples of true heroism and courage in the history of national security organizations. Now, from time to time, he will produce a nugget. And what almost always happens, because we're, we're not accustomed to this, is that there is a message uh, there which we don't get immediately. So here's uh, one uh, example. Uh, oh, here's something that he doesn't um, uh, uh, talk about. It's, it's really rather interesting. He was far happier talking about uh, Soviet spies in Cambridge, Cambridgeshire. Then he is about talking about Soviet spies in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, but what he knows is um, uh, that the penetration of MIT began several years ahead of the penetration of um, uh, Cambridge University, Cambridgeshire. So uh, MIT, which um, uh, needs um, uh, foreign students to at uh, the beginning of the 1930s uh, in order to um, uh, fill in places that are not currently being taken up in the, in, in the Depression. It's an extraordinary story. So there we are. This is the first 23 Russian students who stopped on their way to MIT at New York in order to buy suits. Uh, and um, uh, all of them are either members of uh, the Russian intelligence services or reporting to the Russian intelligence services. So there is Dean Tryon in the middle who knows nothing of this. Two places to his left is one of the most successful uh, Russian intelligence office ever to operate in the, uh, uh, the United States. The one in the middle uh, between them, Chernyavsky, just shows one of the problems of, of stationing uh, American and uh, Russian intelligence officers in the United States. In other words, some of them will get to enjoy the United States so much, they will lose faith in their own system. Uh, so Chernyavsky, who's the one um, just on the right, our left, um, looking uh, at it, Chernyavsky, was actually recalled and executed uh, four years um, uh, later. But the man on his left, uh, and this is the entry at the top from the MIT yearbook, um, uh, Stanislav uh, uh, Shumosky, and it shows him as a student of the yearbook, and th then you see him as an intelligence officer once he's returned to uh, Russia uh, years later, was the most successful, uh, uh, I think, um, uh, spy in aviation in the entire history of aviation, as known to me, but my knowledge is not um, comprehensive. Now, for the kind of thing that uh, Putin does talk about. Um, he, he likes to take us by surprise, and it's not too difficult for him to take us by surprise. So, after this man, Georges Koval, uh, died in 2006, without the West having grasped that, we, we really thought we knew at that point, uh, all the people who had played a major part in the single, I suppose, the most successful intelligence collection operation in history, uh, that is to say the collection of uh, the plans for the first atomic bomb, which were then wholly imitated by the Russians. There was one thing which we didn't realize uh, that had not been got by the people that we knew, and it was the initiation, I don't know how to... Um, uh, get an atomic bomb exploding, but I do know that you need uh, an initiator. And this was a man um, who provided it. 
Georges uh, Colville. He was GIU and not KGB like uh, most of the others. And here is Putin. Shortly after his death, he scarcely drinks, but he's raising a glass of champagne in honor of uh, Koval, um, who he declares on the spot hero of Russia. Now, the timing is very significant, and we didn't get it at the time. So what did we get? Well, uh, it was revealed that the initiator was polonium-210. But polonium-210 can be used for other purposes. And just three months uh, before um, uh, Putin announced uh, that uh, uh, its contribution to the first uh, Russian atomic bomb, polonium-210 had been used to assassinate uh, a KGB and then FSB uh, defector to, to Britain. And it was exactly uh, the same as with the more recent attempt to assassinate uh, Skripal. They spilt the stuff all over the place. And uh, you can see from this map, which there's not time to um, take in, some of the places that they spilt it, as well as um, uh, on the plane on the way and uh, the plane uh, on the way back. And the chief assassin, just as uh, the bunglers uh, at, um, in Salisbury more recently, both heroes of, of Russia. So the chief assassin here is currently um, a member of uh, the Russian parliament. And that's where the... Uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's on the tourist list for some people, but you can go up to the bar in the Millennium Hotel and see where this uh, poor man uh, was uh, uh, assassinated. So what Putin prefers to concentrate on uh, are those with a rather more attractive image, and he so much prefers people from Cambridge, uh, Cambridgeshire uh, than uh, Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts for his propaganda purposes. So here is, uh, is Kim Philby the first and probably the most successful member of the Magnificent Five, and also the first British spy to get his own postage stamp. It was a Russian postage stamp, of course, but there we are. Um, and then there are these series of memorials, and I'm going to pick out a few, uh, to celebrate the 90th anniversary of the SVR, Russian Foreign Intelligence, because they date their foundation from uh, 1920, which I could explain later, but I won't stop to explain now. Um, they celebrate that with actually a rather more interesting memorial than Russians usually uh, uh, produce to spies. So here is um, Kim Philby looking both east and west, which is uh, quite a nice idea. And uh, Fratkov is the man on the right. At that point, he was um, head of Russian foreign intelligence, and uh, uh, Philby's uh, uh, Russian widow is um, in the middle. But uh, only last year, it still goes on, and it will go on for years to come. So only a year ago, the current SVR chief, Sergei Narishkin, uh, opens a Philby exhibition in Moscow, public exhibition, and uh, there is uh, Philby's widow, and here she is getting the usual compulsory uh, bouquet. So what was, what was Philby after? Well, I think the most difficult thing now to remember is that otherwise highly intelligent people could hero worship Stalin. I mean, I don't see any other way of explaining why um, some of the brightest and the best in Britain, and it took rather longer to be accepted in the, in the United States, um, decided to, uh, to work to him. But the images uh, which appeared in the media at the time, uh, which hardly anybody has paid uh, attention to, show it. Here is Stalin as a man of the people. This is from Ogonyok, will some people in, um, here will, uh, will know. Um, up until the early 1930s, he walked around Moscow. And it's, he's such a well-known figure that if you, if you look at the, 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 the picture, and there's so many that they're not all, certainly not all stage, nobody is paying particular attention to him. Now compare that with the British Prime Minister at the time. Ramsay MacDonald, Britain's first um, um, Labour Prime Minister, although first ex-Labour Prime Minister at that time. Now, he was the illegitimate son of a Highland plowman uh, and a, a Scottish um, lady's maid. But as soon as he moves into number 10, uh, as you see, he immediately changes his dress. He wouldn't dream of walking the quarter of a mile from number 10 Downing Street to Parliament. No, there is a limousine, uh, which you can't see, which uh, takes him there. So Stalin is the first man of the people in European history to walk amongst uh, other citizens. 
Uh, we don't even notice the photographs nowadays. It's really not difficult looking back to see what an impression that he made. And there's another one. Uh, and again, <coughs> you know, nobody is particularly paying uh, attention to him. Now, the other thing that has been extraordinarily left out is Stalin's Okhrana Russian uh, Tsarist Intelligence Service file. Here he is as a quite good-looking 23-year-old uh, uh, Georgian uh, revolutionary, probably the, even though I don't think this is a relevant category, uh, the best-looking uh, revolutionary of the, uh, of, of the time. And these are the people who are keeping track of him. Uh, the, the, the most smartly dressed intelligence service that um, I know of, Okrana, and the capital, of course, was in St. Petersburg at, uh, at, at that, that point. Now, it's only people have only just begin, begun looking at what I think is absolutely the central source for beginning to understand Stalin. It's the 125 volume file of his uh, Okrana. Uh, of his Okrana file. And after the revolution, Stalin moved it um, to his own archive where it uh, remains. And it had the most, you know, <laughs> all the way through. I mean, he spent, he must have spent 20 years going through it and annotating every page. This happens to be a page with um, a lot of doodles on it. I can't understand this, but a colleague who claims to be, and I believe her, uh, says that some of the things say teacher, teacher, because he had been uh, given the title in Georgia of teacher of the people, and then there are a number of references to a Moscow football team and the others I can't work out. Um, but what will have astonished him is the extraordinarily intrusive level of surveillance of his private life. Now, his first marriage, uh, I don't think there's much doubt, but it was a love match. I don't think he was capable of a love match after his first wife um, uh, died. There's some extraordinary evidence of this. But he did fancy a few friends' fiancés. And here is one. And uh, he has it sent, uh, actually, from outside uh, Russia to her. And it promises her a hot kiss. And uh, when he finds that in the file, but it, you see, this is just an example, going through his entire life history up to 1917, and seeing how it had been kept under surveillance. And what did he send her? On the other side of the cart, uh, there is a, um, uh, uh, it's not particularly top shelf to use English terminology now, but it's something which would not have been allowed to be posted in New York or in London. And he's sending it to the 16 year old uh, fiance of a friend. Well, no time to go th uh, through that. What other things uh, affect him? You know, here is somebody uh, who is a natural conspiracy theorist, and discovering that people who he had trusted had been betraying him for years is, I think, something that has a permanent effect on his uh, mentality. So here's Roman Malinowski. Malinowski in, uh, was a rare example of a Bolshevik who came from the working class, and God knows there were so few of them that uh, he was given promotion. In 1912, he's head of the leader of the Bolshevik fraction in the Duma, and Lenin, who was rather spending a lot of time in England and other places, rather slow to realize the level of penetration, makes him head of a, a three-man provocation, provocatia uh, commission, to investigate the extent of Okrana penetration of the Bolsheviks. And six months later, um, Malinowski comes back and, and says, uh, well, we've concluded that there must be an Okrana spy very close to the leadership of uh, the Bolshevik party. Absolutely right. The only thing he forgot to mention is that it was him. <laughs> now, one of the things that would have struck me, and not, not simply me, but perhaps everyone here, is that when the CIA bungles, people say, no, it's the CIA bungling. When British intelligence bungles, people say, no, it's British intelligence bungling. But when they, the, the Russian intelligence bungles in Salisbury, people say, it shows just how clever they are. They're pretending to bungle uh, so that um, uh, we don't uh, realize how clever they are. Well, all one's got to do is go back to the Lenin period and see a level of bungling which is beyond anything in the history of the CIA or MI6 or many other people. Uh, so here is Lenin, um, uh, you will already have spotted. Because of the most elementary 
bungles. Lenin actually becomes the file is all there, by the way. There's, I don't think anything at all controversial at an evidential level of what I he becomes the first, and I think still the only head of government or head of state to be victim of a carjacking. So what's going on? He had a limousine. Uh, he wasn't tremendously fond of expensive objects, but he had quite a nice car. And um, he goes to visit his long-suffering wife on the outskirts of Moscow in uh, 1919. But the Cheka failed to provide a security guard. So what happens is exactly this. They're stopped by some uh, uh, bandits on the outskirts of Moscow. And uh, Lenin says, are your papers, please? Uh, probably doesn't say please. Your papers? To which the bandits are, comrade, we are bandits. Bandits don't have to have papers. Um, your wallet, please? Uh, your uh, Browning pistol? Oh, yes, and your car. Uh, so he's left, <laughs> he's, he's left on the pavement. If there was a pavement, and there probably wasn't a pavement. And they don't even catch the bandits, despite there was only one limousine like this uh, for, um, uh, for six months. So, you know, what went on there is pretty much what's been going on in Salisbury over the um, uh, last year. But in the file for this also exists another day when they failed to send anybody to keep guard on uh, Lenin's uh, study. It's vandalized in 1922. We've got the full report, which was drawn up by Jozinski, and he tells um, uh, people that they must look, they must identify those bits of his study which were destroyed with chisels and those that were destroyed with axes because they leave uh, different, uh, different marks. So, but why it is that you know, the brutality is, is well identified, the power is well identified, but the bungling, we seem to find it more difficult to understand Russian bungling than British or American bungling. They, when they really put their minds to it, or when they don't really put their minds to it, they can out-bungle us any day of the week. Um, now, this is a significant photograph. Try finding pictures of Stalin with his arm round other senior Soviet leaders. And they really do like each other. Uh, so what they, I imagine they're discussing, but I can't prove it, and I may easily be wrong, they're discussing uh, their uh, latest plans for assassination. And um, they've concluded that it's really not, uh, the Russian intelligence are not ready to go off to other countries and assassinate people there. So what they must do is um, get them to come to uh, Russia, where it's much more convenient to assassinate them. And this is a remarkable picture. Well, Sidney Riley, the so-called British master spy, wasn't any good by that point. They lure him back to Russia and uh, shoot him in 1925. But then they put the corpse in the sick bay in the Lubyanka, and they have a drinks party. So you know, the culture of assassination, even though it changes from generation to uh, generation, the way of understanding Salisbury um, more recently is to take, I think, um, a long history into account. And of course, Stalin also has these extraordinary relations. The only one I think he really, really liked was Jozinski. But the sheer statistics we, could, which we can get from his diary and agenda, the fact that at the height of the terror, when he had quite a lot on, he meets Yezhov um, 278 times for a total of 834 hours, nearly always including midnight. But of course, um, one of the things, I mean, this was the period when airbrushing uh, reaches its peak in European history. So now you see uh, Yezhov. And uh, now you don't. And uh, of course, this is again one of the. Uh, well, it still happens in Russia, but as I shall be showing at the at the end of my talk, the airbrushing under Putin is now pat on what it was under Stalin. That sounds an exaggeration, but I hope to persuade you that it's not. So, what we need to remember about all this is that Stalin remained passionately interested in Sigmund. You know, everybody knows that about Churchill. But I'm not aware that there is a single book which makes the, uh, to my mind, fairly obvious point that Stalin was just as fascinated by Sigint as um, uh, Ch Churchill was. Um, so looking through Stalin's personal files and the, 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 uh, the blue thing left to right, and that, by the way, when Nicholas II, he always um, used to have a little blue tick on the ones that he'd seen. He, he says, put it in my archives, and so it went. Now, the problem about such um, information as has been made public on uh, uh, Soviet SIGINT is that it's been ludicrously dramatized. So the biggest Bletchley Park secret, the headquarters of British code breakers, and 
with American assistance in the Second World War, that they have a Soviet agent, and his name is John Cancross, the fifth man in the Cambridge Ring of Five. But that dreadful film, The Imitation Game, has this absolutely ludicrous suggestion for which, not merely is there no evidence, there is an enormous amount of opposite evidence, that what Cancross did was blackmail the great codebreaker, Alan Turing, into not revealing that he was a Russian spy, because otherwise he would reveal that he was gay. And, you know, by the time you're that stupid, you're just about bound to win an Oscar, which what happened in this, uh, <laughs> in this, this particular case. But, of course, the real, the real story is much more interesting, uh, because uh, what um, uh, Kerkos was uh, doing, apart from being a spy, he was the first um, British academic, and for all I know, the first American academic, except that he wasn't American, um, to take a real scholarly interest in polygamy. I mean, it always helps to have some practical experience as, uh, as well as a theoretical uh, interest. So this is still available. Uh, this is a history of polygamy, although the illustration seems a little bit um, uh, odd to me. But he got some absolutely terrific reviews after the Second World War. And he got, I think, the best review ever given um, to um, anybody from, and this is a large uh, claim, uh, but uh, I believe it may be true, the most original um, uh, good um, uh, blurb, <laughs> good review that uh, anyone from Cambridge has ever had. <laughs> so, so, so this is Graham Greene, who apart from being at the BBC and uh, MI6, really like books on polygamy. Um, here is at last is a book that will strongly appeal to all polygamists. So think how good the imitation uh, game might have been if they'd concentrated on the book about polygamy. Oh, another lost uh, opportunity. Now, in the meantime, of course, uh, Stalin uh, is uh, keeping enormous numbers of uh, US diplomatic telegrams in his files. It's a real problem because there are too many, really, to uh, file, um, uh, file away. And because even though British security uh, was uh, appalling, it was in a different and better class from uh, the United States. So uh, there is the man who at the time was head of the uh, least secure embassy in Russian history, uh, Ambassador William C. Bullock. You may recall that it's not until 1933 that um, uh, the United States uh, has diplomatic representation. And uh, every word he says is recorded uh, repeatedly. Um, and at least his successor um, knew that he was being bugged. And he actually um, uh, Joseph uh, E. Davis. Once he's given the evidence, he's saying, thank goodness. Um, and as he says, if the Soviets had a dictaphone in the embassy, so much the better. The sooner they would find out that we were friends, not enemies. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Um, so, but it's not until 1944, and I've, I've, I've seen the evidence, I've seen the original documents, that it occurs to somebody actually in the FBI uh, that it might be a good idea to have an electronic sweep of um, the US Embassy in Moscow. And on day one, they discover 120 hidden microphones, which is about as many as you can discover in a particular day. But of course, that is only a tiny fraction of the total number. Uh, meanwhile, uh, of, of, of course, I mean, I really don't think that at any point in world history, and I look forward to dealing with this exaggerated claim uh, from more sober questioning afterwards, there's ever been a moment at which one power has known so much about a, one of his chief allies that he just couldn't take it all in. So here we are, um, Paul Roosevelt having been persuaded to go um, all the way to Yalta because it was so much easier for the Russians to bug Yalta than it would have been uh, somewhere outside Russia. And alas, alas, you've only got to look at the photograph to see that his life expectancy is, is pretty limited. The Lavadia Palace, where he used to be able to uh, go and uh, take... Um, uh, uh, lecture audiences um, is not merely where the big three met, but also where the U.S. delegation uh, stayed. And this is what Stalin saw every day during the negotiations. So there he is on the left. Looking across, he can see Roosevelt. And immediately behind Roosevelt, he can see one of the most valued spies. Now, it, it used to be thought that Alger Hiss was just extremely well-meaning and, and the victim of American fascism. Um, uh, but of course, actually, he was an extremely successful uh, Soviet um, spy. So 
having to deal with the continuous bugging of uh, the, the, uh, the American embassy with the Lavadia Palace and uh, daily reports of the various agents in the Lavadia Palace, it amounts to intelligence overload of a kind that um, uh, must be difficult to deal with. And of course, April 1945, you can see Molotov trying not to look incredibly pleased in the bottom left-hand corner as Aldous presides at the UN Charter Conference in the uh, San Francisco. So he could easily have become, but obviously did not become, her Secretary General. Then fast forward to uh, 1960. Um, one of the things that the American Embassy has given in uh, Moscow at the beginning of the, of the Cold War is this um, uh, wooden model allegedly produced by Soviet schoolchildren, which he hangs above his desk, which is extremely convenient and because it records everything, including George Kennan's long telegram uh, that um, is uh, sent um, to uh, uh, Washington. And only recently has it been discovered that the British Embassy in uh, Moscow, obviously not quite the same level of uh, priority, is just as penetrated as it had been in, in uh, Tsarist times. And I've actually spoken to the former SIS officer who was involved. Uh, after the Americans realized just how badly they were penetrated, uh, British Ambassador Sir Frank Roberts, a really distinguished British diplomat, was persuaded that he ought to allow his office to be checked. And as the man who did it has told me, he didn't believe that it was possible. And he said, you've got 20 minutes. And at the end of the 20 minutes, this man was just pulling from behind a skirting board, a, um, uh, a, uh, one of the listening devices. And Roberts grabbed it from his hand and started swearing extremely fluently uh, <laughs> in, into it. So talk about open diplomacy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but it, it goes on in the, uh, the American case. In 1962, Khrushchev complains to the U.S. ambassador uh, that he's hostile to the uh, selling of um, uh, oil and gas pipelines, uh, American oil and gas. But the only place he could have got this was from the uh, intercepted, or the most likely place, intercepted um, uh, uh, dispatches. So uh, now uh, another area in which we've got new information, which I do think changes. There's this belief for many years that what was going on is that the British uh, Labour Party had a pretty balanced view of Russia, uh, but um, uh, these uh, silly paranoids from the British Security Service, uh, MI5, um, uh, tried to persuade them that some Labour MPs were in hock to Russia. And it was exactly that <laughs> the other way around. MI5 had begun to regard the leadership of the British Labour Party as um, a little bit excitable. Um, um, but um, in 1961, the Labour leadership, which for those who know about the leadership, leadership was uh, uh, Gateskill and George Brown as his, his deputy and one or two others, take um, to the House of Commons this list of Labour MPs they actually want MI5 to keep a check on. So the ones they think are actually CP, members of the Communist Party, on the left-hand side, and you can see the total on the left-hand side, 18, and then the possible ones, uh, nine. And uh, uh, MI5 just thinks that uh, the Labour leadership is getting a bit overheated, so it doesn't pay too much attention, which is a pity, because the man in the top left-hand corner, uh, W. Owen, Will Owen, Labour MP for Morpeth, was in fact uh, a fully recruited um, uh, Soviet bloc uh, spy. Um, where is his file? Well, one of the smart things that the Russians realized in the 1960s is that it was far easier for Czech intelligence, as the, the British, quite rightly, um, still had um, uh, rather bad feelings about uh, Munich. And it was so much easier for uh, Czechoslovak intelligence to recruit MPs uh, than it was for uh, Russians. So the material is, is uh, now available, uh, and we've been going through quite a lot of it because fortunately we have one or two Czechoslovak speakers, not including me. Years and years ago I, I did have a book which said, Teach Yourself Czech, and I abandoned hope at the middle of uh, chapter three. There are far too many cases and, and, and so on. So that's where Will Owen's file is now, and uh, it's pretty exciting um, uh, stuff. Uh, his official code name was Lee, but um, he was so greedy. I mean, right up to the point when he was leaving the embassy, he would empty the cigar box and put it in his inside pocket. So they gave him the alternative name of Greedy Bastard. Um, and then here is a name which uh, used to be famous, infamous in Britain, 
one of uh, uh, Wilson's ministers, not a cabinet minister at the end of the 1960s, was confident that he would rise to become foreign secretary. And he tells, he tells the STB, and again, his file is available, that he'd be far more use to them. But he's also a confidence trickster, and um, uh, the older amongst us uh, will recall that he's the last British Labour M uh, MP to fake his, his own suicide. He, he left his uh, uh, carefully arranged clothes on a Florida beach uh, and uh, didn't turn up. But all the time, uh, he had gone with um, his uh, woman friend, not his wife, to Australia where he was, um, he was tracked. Down. So uh, now it's, it's I, I, the point I want to come to now is the thing that I think Western intelligence got most wrong during the, uh, the Cold War. It confused the frequent, though not invariable, success of Russian intelligence collection with the inability to understand what the meaning of political intelligence was. So what you currently get at times of crisis is the belief that the United States is preparing a nuclear first strike. Now, once again, the, the evidence is not in doubt. June 1960, Shelopin, who was reckoned to be about the uh, smartest head of the KGB before and drop off, tells Khrushchev, and he comes round to the Kremlin to say it, in the CIA it is known that the leadership of the Pentagon is convinced of the need to initiate a war with the Soviet Union, quote, as soon as possible. Where does this come from? Well, it comes from uh, General Jack D. Ripper, or as he was known at the time, General Curtis LeMay, head of Strategic Air Command. In other words, the, the KGB was picking up the kind of things that uh, after a few cigars and um, several bottles of bourbon, no, that's an exaggeration, just several glasses of bourbon, uh, General Curtis LeMay would say, you know, why don't we finish them off? And uh, they... The, the, the KGB couldn't fail to realize this, this is just the kind of thing he said after dinner as opposed to a carefully prepared strategic um, plan. And so this is, of course, uh, Dr. Strangelove, the most brilliant film uh, ever made um, about um, uh, nuclear warfare, but I haven't got time to... Uh, yeah. but, but it's the GRU as well. Now, the Russians themselves have released this. The GRU later tells Khrushchev that the United States had planned to launch a surprise nuclear attack in September 1961, but had been deterred at the last moment because Soviet nuclear tests appeared to indicate that the Soviet nuclear arsenal was more powerful and therefore they would be able to realize and therefore they'd be able to uh, deal with a second strike. And it's at this very moment in March 1962 that uh, Khrushchev takes the decision to put missile bases in Cuba. I can't prove there's a connection but it would be pretty odd if there was no connection at all. So what else is Khrushchev using? Well, he's continuing the uh, tradition of assassination operations. This is not central, but it's uh, nonetheless a continuous part. And it, of course, the, the main targets are the traitors. Now, the definition of traitor uh, changes over the years, but uh, the ones that they were most anxious about were uh, Ukrainian nationalist leaders who were in uh, exile, and mainly they were in exile in Germany. Now, one's only got to look at the bungles that this produced to see that even though it's not uh, wholly bungling, how anybody can regard the bungles of the last few years as out of the historical tradition, I don't know. So here we are, Nikolai Khokhrov, uh, KGB assassin sent to West Germany to kill Ukrainian emigre leaders, but he doesn't because he makes friends with the man who he was supposed to assassinate, who's the man who doesn't look entirely amused, uh, Georgi Okolovich, uh, on, the, uh, on the right. And then he gives a press conference. Uh, I mean, this kind of stuff may look pretty straightforward now, but believe me, I mean, electrically operated guns with cyanide bullets concealed in cigarette packets was beyond the imagination of James Bond uh, in those days. So um, the bungling uh, is right back um, to the Lenin era and beyond any bungle which I believe is the Putin uh, age. So here are the current bunglers. All right. You rarely see assassins who are having such a good time. Um, uh, these are the ones that went to um, uh, Salisbury and of course they're breaking by their expressions, the things that they're wearing, all the other kind of stuff, uh, having believed they've just um, uh, uh, you know, left poison behind which will dispose of, uh, of scribble. And they are both heroes of Russia. Putin doesn't half pick them. 
Um, and uh, there, there, of course, I mean, in the entire history of bogus cover stories, I mean, it may be possible, but I really challenge colleagues afterwards to think of anything sillier than, oh, we, we were really impressed by the fact that Salisbury Cathedral uh, has a spire which is taller than Norwich Cathedral. Um, I come from Norwich, and we're so pleased we only have the second tallest spire because that means we have no problem with assassination operations. Um, <laughs> just again, the, the complete lack of cover. And I think the argument that there's a complete lack of cover because they're brilliant uh, is um, scarcely... Look at the man on the right, Alexander Mishkin, uh, alias Alexander uh, uh, Petrov. He really does look like a special needs assassin. And I, uh, <laughs> so these are the ones they were after, and of course they were. Uh, and, but the fact that Mishkin's Mercedes, the paper trail, including the speeding tickets should be available in a way in which, to the best of my knowledge, uh, members of both British and American intelligence who have picked up lots of speeding tickets. I don't think any British or American intelligence officer has ever left such a, a, a trail behind. Now, um, uh, uh, good news. This is a man that I've had a lot to uh, uh, do with, or did uh, before his, uh, his, his death. One of the, 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 the most admirable things about the extraordinary archives of the KGB is they lost control of them. Why? Well, not wholly down to this man, but uh, Vasily Mitrokhin. Uh, I mean, told his story at uh, great length, so I'm not going to do so again. But um, over um, a, a period of 15 years, because he was in charge of moving the Foreign Intelligence Archive from the Lubyanka to the new headquarters uh, at Yasinovo on the outskirts of, uh, of Moscow, he was able to collect this huge intelligence archive. But he saw himself all the time as a whistleblower. He wanted it to be known. The only way it could be known was getting it to the West. But until the Soviet Union fell apart, there was no way of getting it to, to the West. And then what happens? Um, when it does fall, fall apart, he um, essentially dressed uh, as a street person, as you can see here, has a roll along, uh, which um, has um, uh, copies of the secret documents at the bottom, which he knows will check out because they um, give the, the real identities of a series of Russian illegals, and he knows that British and American intelligence will be able to check some of that. Then on the top of that, he has uh, dirty washing, and then some uh, clean clothing, and then highly spiced uh, sausages and so on, and exactly the kind of thing that he hoped correctly would mean that the, uh, the immigration, immigration authorities only just being established would mean that they wouldn't look at his newspaper. And then... He tries to get into an American embassy, but so many other people are trying to get into American embassies to get visas, he doesn't. He goes along to a British embassy in one of the, the Baltic states, and he goes in with his pull-along, and he pulls out some of this stuff beneath, beneath the sausages and the uh, dirty clothing, and he asks to see an, uh, a young diplomat, and my goodness, uh, she saw things which a lot of others wouldn't see. First of all, uh, I mean, she, by the way, she, she's now an ambassador, but um, uh, she doesn't wish her identity to be known, so I'm not going to, uh, uh, to mention it. Um, she realizes that this material will check out um, if it's accurate. So she takes the material and then says something which only a British diplomat could say and gives me an extraordinary sense of personal pride, which in the Brexit era is pretty rare nowadays. Um, so what she says to him is, would you like a cup of tea? <laughs> oh, isn't it wonderful? I don't think to say, to, to, uh, say, say that now. Um, and um, so he had his first ever cup of, uh, of British tea. The material was checked out. Um, he came to England with this huge lorry load of stuff and his wife and son. And I met him and we lived happily ever after. Um, now, there he is. Um, uh, that's the book that I wrote with him, um, as you can you can see he's disguised there, not very well disguised. And this is what the FBI and the CIA say about it. I mean, it's just extraordinary. I mean, there's not everything there. There's nothing about Andorra, uh, for example. There's some very interesting stuff on San Marino and uh, the most other countries of the world, not full documents. And it's now available, I'm glad to say, um, since our book came out. It's available in Churchill College Archive, Cambridge. Uh, just next to the papers of uh, Winston Churchill and Margaret Thatcher. And those are the three collections of papers that are the most consulted at Churchill nowadays. Now, what do we get out of it? 
Well, here's what most changed my mind. I had the view, as I think um, many people do, that the illegals, you know, fantastic technical achievement, as in those silly films of the Americans, um, to manage to present yourself as another nationality so successful, as you'll remember in, in the case of the ghost stories, uh, ones, that some of the children of the illegals don't even realize that their parents are Russian rather than American. An incredible technical feat, which in the West really hasn't been worth it. No, where it really makes a difference is in the Soviet bloc. Because any time there was dissidents, as for example in 1968 um, in, the, in the Prague Spring, illegals who managed to pass themselves off as British journalists, um, German um, uh, businessmen and so on, would say to the leaders um, of um, uh, the, uh, the dissidents, uh, is what can we do to help you? And so this is the list on the left-hand side, one of whom, uh, Gronov, is um, the, the codename of Gordievsky's uh, elder brother, um, uh, uh, by the way, of the people pretending to be Westerners. And it was a brilliantly simple device. There's no major distant outbreak in Eastern Europe which is not penetrated by KGB uh, illegal. So there he is. Uh, Yuri Andropov, this is a period in which he didn't get to be a Soviet leader without being terminally ill, as you can uh, And then, now, back to Putin. And um, I am reaching some kind of, uh, of conclusion. So just the idea that this is someone, as he since admitted, was just absolutely fascinated by Russian intelligence history. So fascinated that, as he himself has described, at the age of 16, he goes up to the only ugly building in St. Petersburg, which is the KGB headquarters. It was always said that it, um, it was an ugly building, um, is an ugly building, uh, but there was a wonderful view from the top. You could see all the way to Siberia, um, where you, you, you can't know. And then, you can see as a failure. I mean, Having got into the job that he had always wanted, he's not sent to one of the prime jobs. He's sent to East Germany, which, as you can see from the expression, because he doesn't know he's being uh, photographed, he finds less than fascinating. Now, we know he's a failure. How do we know he's a failure? Because this man was not a failure, Yevgeny Primakov, uh, who was um, uh, leading international uh, relations um, expert and made um, with a great reputation in the West who becomes SVR director in the five years after the fall of the old regime. And he, he says afterwards about Putin, I never met Putin or heard a word about him. But he was so unsuccessful, why would you? I mean, he had to be of average ability uh, in the field uh, for um, Primakov to have uh, heard of him. So nonetheless, he's always been astonishingly good at intriguing his way to whatever job he wanted. What was the job he wanted? Uh, he wanted to be head of the FSB, internal successor of the KGB, and he is. And then um, um, uh, Yeltsin, who, as you see, doesn't look incredibly pleased about it, uh, makes um, him the successor as president. And who is he surrounded by? Well, in particular, his three intelligence chiefs, all on the EU and not simply the EU sanctions list. Now, you know, the, the, the main um, media, not simply media, preoccupation um, over the, uh, the last couple of years has been the attempt, um, the Russian attempt to uh, interfere in recent Russian uh, elections. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, the, the best report that has so far been produced, because, although there are others in prospect, is the one that was produced under the Obama regime. And there is no reason, it seems to me, to doubt its general conclusion. Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered an influence campaign in 2016 aimed at the U.S. presidential election. Russia's goals were to undermine public faith in the U.S. democratic process, denigrate Secretary Clinton, harm her electability and potential presidency. We further assess Putin and the Russian government developed a clear preference for President-elect Trump. That's it. And it was obvious even, even before the, the, the last American presidential election. <laughs> now, at, at one level, there is nothing new about this. I and others have published a lot of these forgeries. And broadly speaking, the KGB never saw an election it didn't want to influence. And that is, after all, the making of the Soviet bloc. Um, these countries that um, did not wish to be communist 
but within a few years of coaching of their uh, newly founded uh, Communist Intelligence Services, were capable of producing 99% majorities. Nothing uh, that uh, Russian foreign intelligence has achieved outside the former Soviet bloc. Uh, and because they go to enormous trouble to produce um, forgeries uh, like this, I and others have uh, published a, a number of them. This is an attempt to show that um, uh, there were secret relations with the apartheid regime and, um, and plenty of others. But these forgeries produced you know, very little impact. So it's the combination of a traditional Russian intelligence obsession combined with social media, which has changed the influence. Now, of course, that, as always in intelligence, um, what one needs to do is uh, to bring together the open sources with the uh, intelligence uh, sources. And what we're dealing with is a level of autocratic narcissism, which there is very few comparisons that one can make um, when, uh, in the last few hundred years. Um, but um, the last person before Putin uh, to believe that he looked better with his shirt off um, was Mussolini. And the last person before Mussolini uh, was uh, um, uh, Napoleon, but um, uh, this was Canova, and uh, Canova, um, uh, the portrait shows not um, uh, Napoleon. Well, it shows Napoleon's head, but the body is a fit young Italian, a good deal fitter than Mussolini uh, there. So there, there's um, mercifully not time to go through all the open source material, but it's only when one puts together I mean, the stuff that gives Putin extraordinary pleasure would be regarded by any of the rest of us as just pathetic. I mean, to feel the need to pose in his early 60s as one of Russia's leading ice hockey players. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know if there's any therapy that could, um, uh, could deal with that, but there he is. And you, you read Russian. It says Putin on the back, and he's just scoring the eighth of his eight, goal, eight goals in the 186 triumph by the National Hockey League All-Stars over, uh, over the second uh, team. And uh, if I had an hour, and the good news is that I don't, I could produce an endless list of equally silly photographs, which aren't Mussolini, Mussolini any day of um, uh, the week. Now, here's a side of Putin, which for some reason, um, a, a lot of Western commentators seem to be in uh, denial. Now, uh, exactly its significance, I don't pretend to understand, because the, all the compartments in Putin's brain, it's very difficult to see how they actually come together, and I think that must be a problem for him. But he likes photos like this. His mother revealed in 2000, uh, he, he revealed in 2012 that um, uh, 10 years earlier, before she died, his mother had revealed that she'd had him baptized in secret. And if it had not been in secret, of course, he would never have been allowed into the KGB, or if it had already been in, he would have been um, uh, kicked out. But so what we, what we find now, and it's not difficult, my students go to this um, place, you can go to divine um, uh, service there. Um, Putin has established, it's a basilica, it's not a cathedral, but it is the basilica of uh, St. Sophia in central Moscow, quite close to Red Square. And uh, furthermore, um, uh, Petrushev, um, who's the current national security uh, advisor, they've presented the, uh, the church with these icons of St. George the Dragon Slayer. And... Again, not something for which there's any possible comparison in British America or most other intelligence history. The chiefs of the intelligence services are having to go along to divine service with Putin from time to time. So there is Fradkov. You can tell that Fradkov has not been to um, Easter services all that frequently, uh, but uh, there he is with, uh, with Putin, and there are lots of others that I could produce, but the good news is I'm not going to. And he gets on astonishingly well with successive patriarchs. Alexei II was a former KGB agent uh, whose name was Drozhnov um, Thrush. But uh, uh, again, that is not, I think, to belittle him entirely because um, in, under the Russian uh, tradition, giving unto Caesar those things that belong to Caesar and giving unto God those things that belong to God, there, there's um, 
it's, it's possible for people to live two separate lives. So I'm perfectly prepared to believe, although not wholly convinced, uh, that patriarchs can have a genuine spiritual life while having a sycophantic relationship with the Putin uh, regime. So here is Putin praising the Orthodox Church for creating a spirit of patriotism among uh, young Russians. It was de rigueur to be anti-Christian, and now it's de rigueur to be Christian. And uh, this is the current um, patriarch, um, Kirill, with whom he gets on, as you can see, extremely well. And Kirill calls Putin's leadership, and there are many other quotations like this, a miracle of God. Now, here's one of the problems. Putin uh, is obsessed with bling, but a particular kind of bling, which I'll come on to. But Kirill likes a bit of bling himself. And how do we know this? Well, because the airbrushing skills have been largely lost um, uh, you know, in the Photoshop era. So um, Kirill likes a fancy watch, although uh, not nearly as fancy watches as um, Putin um, does. Putin wouldn't be seen dead in a $30,000 watch, but Kirill would be seen alive. Now, on the right-hand side, what happened was that after a complaint that Kirill was uh, wearing a $30,000 watches, his office um, published a photograph which shows that the particular meeting where he was supposed to have worn this $30,000 watch, he wasn't wearing a watch at all. But just look in the heavily polished mahogany table. <laughs> you, you can see uh, an exact image of the watch that he wasn't wearing. And uh, so then the office had to say they'd been a bit of a mistake. And they published the correct photograph um, on the, um, uh, the left-hand side, which shows the watch as, as well as the, the image. Now, the, the best way of um, uh, um, paying, uh, noticing the kind of bling that uh, Putin particularly likes is when he makes a speech. He holds his hand up like this. And there has been a very scholarly study of the watches that he wore over a four-month period. Now, I can't identify this watch, but I know you wouldn't be able to get it for $30,000. So as has been shown, in uh, one four-month period, the value of the watches uh, that he wore was six times that of his um, annual salary, which is a suitable point at, at which to end. And I look forward to questions. Thank you very much. No, no, as soon as somebody else did. <laughs> Marilyn knows who to pick. Yes, thank you. Uh, Professor Andrew, thanks again for a great talk. Uh, I, uh, the ambassador, uh, Ambassador Meyer, uh, in 1905, uh, announced that uh, the U.S. knew that the Russians uh, were intercepting and decoding. What made him do that? Uh, why wasn't there a misinformation or disinformation campaign first? Uh, did he know that they knew that he knew? Well, my, my view is, and I welcome other um, uh, contributions from the audience, is that the State Department paid no attention to the confidentiality of American diplomatic um, uh, communications. The example that I produced in my um, first lecture is the way that the, you didn't need WikiLeaks um, in the last generation of the 19th century because it was all done by the State Department. So that every year uh, they produced a collection uh, and published a collection of the most interesting dispatches uh, sent by um, American ambassadors over the previous generation. And um, well, I produced the um, uh, the example from a Yale ambassador by saying that none of them um, uh, any longer um, dared send uh, back to Washington uh, their um, uh, serious thoughts. It's, it's just very difficult to put oneself back into a period, and uh, this was true in ancient institutions on both sides of the Atlantic, in which paying attention to security was just not something that one did. So here's a very short personal confession. Uh, when I was senior tutor in the 1980s at my own Cambridge College, uh, to the best of my belief, and my belief is, I think, correct, I was the first person to lock the fire room door, and indeed the senior tutor's door, when I left. It's just that 
was so distrustful to lock a door which would prevent students from going and looking at their, um, uh, their, their, their files. It, it, uh, and, and, uh, again, we didn't use to lock out bikes uh, and so on. The, the Foreign Office did not have, and um, this can be established um, uh, from uh, documents for that in difficulty at all, not merely did it not have a security department, it did not have a single security officer before the First World War. So this meant that embassies um, uh, in a whole series of places were producing more British diplomatic correspondence than the Russians could uh, keep track of. Just one example, but it's one which the, the documentation is, I think, by now reasonably well known. The, um, uh, the British ambassadors, successive British ambassadors in uh, in, in, in Rome, their valet and uh, their main valet and then um, his, his brother would remove stuff from the, um, the ambassador's two safes. Not difficult in case of one of the safes because it didn't have a back, but there was one that they had to be opened from the front. And then they would pass it on uh, to, the, um, uh, to the Russians. And then because the ambassador didn't notice what was going on, they decided to give copies to Mussolini as well. And the detail of all this is extremely well known. So I think the difficulty that I have, and I suspect that other people have as well, is just putting oneself back into an era in which just thinking about security at all was so alien that people didn't do it. So, uh, of course, I have to note that this is the Henry L. Stimson lecture, and I wonder whether you'd comment on his alleged comment that gentlemen don't read other gentlemen's mail, and then his decision to yes. do away with the coding cap well, capabilities. Well, I, I keep moving around, and um, I apologize for that, but I, the first 10 minutes of my first lecture were, um, uh, were on that. But what I find um, of particular interest is that he changes his mind more than any other uh, major um, uh, U.S. Um, uh, official in, I think, the last century or, or so, because when he becomes Secretary of State um, in a Republican regime in uh, 1929, he probably didn't say, gentlemen, do not read each other's mail, but he certainly thought it. And he, he describes the, the, the practice of intercepting the correspondence of ambassadors and other envoys accredited to uh, Washington as entirely uh, unacceptable, deeply unethical. And it is he who closes down uh, the SIGINT agency, popularly uh, known for the few who knew about it as the, as the Black Chamber. And then, you know, uh, if, if you look, as I've had um, uh, the privilege of doing, and his diaries at the beginning of the, the Second World War, partly encouraged by his association with the, um, uh, with the British, um, he can't get enough SIGINT. So there's just one, uh, one example that I recommend. Well, actually there's more than one, but there's just one that I'll, I'll mention. August 1940, he puts in his diary that American Codebreaker is doing something which is so exciting and so important that he can't even put it in his diary. What's he referring to? The breaking of the Japanese diplomatic uh, code um, uh, cipher um, uh, purple. So, um, you know, what, uh, what a career. I mean, uh, someone whose first experience of secrets was skull and bones, and whose final experience of uh, major secrets uh, was the detonation of the first um, uh, atomic bomb in, uh, in, in Hiroshima. Uh, the material in the, uh, the Stimson papers, not simply his, uh, his, his, his diary, is something I have to restrain myself from giving any more examples of, but I've given just a taste, I hope. And there's a question behind you first, and then perhaps, perhaps you next. Professor, um, <laughs> I, 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 didn't, I didn't know. I don't, I'm not a student of this. My name is Gene Connolly. I'm a student. I was a, a student at Yale in 1953. A lot's happened since then, I think. Is there anything new? 
in the intelligence business. Um, is there anything that can still surprise you? Because what you've said surprises the life out of me. And I don't know what to think. Can you tell me, should I sleep tonight or not? Uh, yes, I would. Uh, I mean, I've been saying that um, when I ever I switch on American television, I see there these wonderful pillows uh, which guarantee uh, a good night's sleep for only, <laughs> only, only $10,000. I mean, I'm a little bit skeptical, but I'll, I'll move back to the, the point of your question. 1953 is a good date to mention because the first person to diagnose clearly the problem, others must have sensed it before, was Sherman Kent, um, you know, a great historian but uh, of this university, but also somebody who understood the underlying problem. And the underlying problem over the centuries is um, uh, simply this, that intelligence history is not linear. It's sometimes worse in one century than it was 200 years before. I've given one example, but I'll, 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 I'll give another in these uh, lectures. And the, 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 the reason is straightforward. I mean, it's pretty difficult for all of us to learn uh, from experience. But if you're in a profession which doesn't even know what the, the experience was, you're going to get it considerably worse. So I give this example simply because it's a, a current centenary. Uh, so in a few days' time, we are celebrating, and I think it's a subject for uh, celebrating, um, uh, the end of the First World War. Well, there is, to my mind, no question, and I don't really believe that anyone looks at the evidence would uh, arrive at a different conclusion. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, the best educated president in American history so far, and it's difficult to imagine many more presidents of American universities becoming president in the immediate future, um, uh, his understanding of intelligence doesn't begin to compare with that um, of George Washington. And his contemporary at the beginning of, the, of the, the, the Second World War, and I've argued this with, I hope, more than adequate detail um, in my uh, latest book, H. H. Asquith, is not in the same class as Pitt the Elder and Pitt uh, the Younger. So, you know, in no other profession would you find highly intelligent, well-educated people, as at Bletchley Park, breaking Hitler's codes, who had no idea that every time we're threatened with an invasion, slight exaggeration, but every time we're threatened with a really major uh, invasion, um, Napoleon, at the beginning of the 19th century, the period when all those Martello towers were put up, were breaking his codes. And the people who broke his codes had the slightest idea that um, before the, uh, the Armada, Philip II's codes were, um, uh, were, uh, were being broken. So this is an area uh, which proves more than any other that I can think of the old platitude, and all platitudes by definition are, are, are true, that those who do not understand past mistakes are doomed to repeat them. Pearl Harbor is a pretty good example of that. Sorry, you were the next question, I think. from the political science department. I had a, a, a joint question. The first would be, since you, and thank you very much for the uh, comments on the Russians, but since you've studied this function over the centuries, have you come up with uh, some idea as to what two or three aspects of a country or of a government are essential to become really a first-class player in the intelligence game. And the second question is whether you think that high-tech currently has, in fact, deeply influenced the intelligence game and in what way? Well, to answer the first question first, um, I think, first of all, it's essential to be a multi-party democracy. Um, in all autocratic systems, uh, autocrats are told what they want to hear. Now, as far back as um, uh, Elizabeth I, which was an extremely successful period, um, uh, Walsingham, uh, when he told her something which he didn't want to hear, uh, she would take off her slipper, and she was a very good shot, and catch him on the, on the, on the side of the, uh, of the head. Now, anybody who tells Stalin something that he didn't want to hear, this would not simply be a bad career move. It would be a life-shortening um, uh, experience. Now, 
as, as for the difference that current media has um, made, it simply, or oh, simply is not the correct qualifier. It's um, uh, essentially uh, uh, the, um, another form of the problem of, uh, you know, you've got a wonderful intelligent source, now how do you understand it? Uh, and um, uh, the, the social, um, uh, social media, I think, is a step backwards in human understanding anyway, uh, because uh, those who have access to the Sterling Library and other places already have formidable access um, to uh, reliable uh, in information. It has simply meant that a higher proportion of um, the information available to educated young people is inaccurate than at any previous moment in uh, 20th century British or American history. Uh, that is my view, which I do not expect to be a universal view. You mentioned his name in the, uh, you're just, you know, the previous answer you were giving Walsingham. Where would you rank Sir Francis Walsingham in intelligence history? I, w I would um, rank him very high, although why he was so good um, is a more difficult question. It was partly to do with uh, the fact that, you know, there is a real threat. I mean, the fact that um, Queen Elizabeth I survived at all is simply uh, astonishing. Uh, there were threats to assassinate her, which very nearly uh, succeeded two of her contemporaries, uh, kings of France. They were both assassinated. Her successor, um, uh, uh, James I of England, James VI of, uh, uh, of Scotland, were only a few days after Guy Fawkes Day. And as most people in this room will know, the nearest we have to a national celebration is Guy Fawkes Day, when the king, his ministers, and a huge number of other people were almost blown up by 26 barrels of gunpowder that were only discovered at the, uh, at the last moment. So he, the very fact that Walsingham, who combines the jobs of foreign minister, foreign secretary, uh, and uh, in, intelligence chief, gets to see uh, Elizabeth I every day is an indication of, of, um, of the priorities. But the uh, assassination uh, attempts and um, uh, the threat from the Armada could not have been dealt with uh, without very good intelligence uh, that was very well dealt with. And I will just um, give one example of, I showed some pictures um, the couple of days, three days ago, which made the point in a, in a different way. But um, Queen Elizabeth I personally contacts her chief codebreaker and um, uh, thanks him, gives him a, a pension. So one of the points I was trying to make in earlier lectures is that the chief co-brokers, depending on the country, but Britain and France come to mind, and Venice, got more um, uh, personal praise from the rulers than any in, um, intelligent, any, any co-brokers of the 20th and 21st century. There's just this sort of curious belief that anything to do with code-breaking and signals intelligence must be more influential in um, uh, the 20th century than it was in the 16th. But the handling of um, uh, SIGINT before the Armada was in a completely different class from the handling of SIGINT before Pearl Harbor. I have a question. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I am curious to know about countries that you you haven't mentioned, like India, for instance, yes. Pakistan, oh, any yes. of those in South America. What can you tell us about their well, intelligence? I, I, I did mention India in, in lecture okay. one, but um, uh, not enough. But uh, let me resume my main point, which I can't think of any other area of human knowledge in which the Greeks and the Romans were so far behind uh, their main uh, uh, Asian uh, contemporaries. Now, obviously, Sun Tzu um, is uh, the, the, the Chinese sage and correspondent contemporary of uh, Confucius is the main one. But the Arthur Shastra, uh, the Indian uh, equivalent, is uh, another, um, uh, I think, um, uh, striking example. Now, what happens, of course, is that those classic texts get forgotten. And they're only rediscovered in the 20th century, and they're largely rediscovered, at least initially, by um, Western scholars. And um, uh, you mentioned Pakistan. Well, there is time for me to give just um, uh, uh, one example. 
Um, uh, thank goodness my first-hand experience of warfare has been astonishingly small. Uh, but um, in the final stages, 1987, of uh, the Russian war, and it is fair to call it that, on Afghanistan, I went along. And um, I went to have uh, lunch with um, uh, some friends at the headquarters of the Khyber Rifles. Um, uh, the way to get there is perfectly straightforward. You go up the Khyber Pass, and it's the third big boulder from the top. You turn uh, right, and you go around a corner, and then you see the Khyber Rifles in kilts doing a sword dance. And uh, you made to feel really welcome. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll cut all the rest, um, except to say that after lunch, uh, we went and were able to look at a Soviet air attack on the Jadin positions in the, um, uh, the next uh, valley. And this man, who was a senior in, uh, in ISI, uh, a senior Pakistani intelligence officer, I said, you must have briefed hundreds of people over the last um, uh, 10, 12 years here. And I said, um, who would you say was the smartest? And he said, what an easy question, Richard Nixon. <coughs> I'm not going to attempt to uh, um, uh, defend how I arrived at that, but just that strategic ability to um, uh, grasp the strategic um, uh, issues. Um, um, anyway, I won't go any further than that, but I was impressed by his answer. We could take one last question, ladies and gentlemen, if there is one. Yes, up there, please. Thank you. Um, this is perhaps a different area of intelligence, but when Ronald Reagan took office, he engaged in this huge uh, military buildup designed to bring the Russians to the bargaining table. And my question is, was that buildup really necessary, or were the Soviets willing and eager to get there anyway for reasons of their own? My view would be um, no to both of, us, uh, of, of those questions, but let, let me expand um, uh, a little bit. And what he, he failed to realize, and he wasn't the only one, that if you talk um, about the Russians as an evil empire, you know, if you, if you knew, if, if we had known the way that they reacted to rhetoric uh, like that before, uh, they would, um, he would have realized that um, they would think that he really was preparing uh, a uh, nuclear first um, uh, strike, which they did, Operation um, uh, Rion. And um, the, the main aim of Soviet foreign intelligence was to collect in the United States and its main allies, um, Britain above all, evidence of this uh, non-preparation. And of course, uh, uh, the um, <laughs> uh, the uh, senior Soviet um, intelligence officers in London and Washington didn't dare say that it was um, all crazy. But to be fair to Reagan, he realized what he'd done in his diaries. Um, he says that you know the Russians had no reason to be afraid, but they were. And um, it is, I think, not an exaggeration to say that after he had been given the, the intelligence in November uh, 1983 of the extent of the Russian fears, he tones down the rhetoric almost from one day to the next. The phrase evil empire is never produced by him after uh, November uh, 1983. So it, you know, the, the fact that, A, he made a terrible mistake is, it seems to me, um, uh, to a significant degree compensated by the fact that he does something which most people who make terrible mistakes do not do. That is to say, realize that he's made a terrible mistake. I think it remains for me, ladies and gentlemen, to ask if you would join me in uh, expressing thanks to Chris Andrew for this year's Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.